Good morning, folks. As uh, Guy said, my name's Leon, uh, and it's a privilege to share with you this morning part two. And um, <clears throat> I'm, I, I want to be a little bit vulnerable with you as I share this message today. I've never had to dig quite so deep in preparing a message, and, and the weight of today's message has been on me for quite some time. So, A, I'm quite glad to be finally delivering this message, because I think it's going to deliver me from some weight. But, folks, the, what I want to get through today, there's quite a bit. Now, I'm a very good storyteller, and I like speaking, so I tend to waffle. <laughs> I don't have time for that today. So, if you see I'm reading a lot more than usual, please forgive me in advance. Um, I'm very good at disclaimer language. Uh, when I asked Nicole out, it was an email that was about three pages of disclaimer, and I said, and will you go out with me? So I'm good at that stuff. <laughs> but I hope this morning you will carry the heart of what we're trying to say as a church to you, as, our, as, as, as those have been added to our number. Sorry, this thing is going to undo me. It's a bright thing on the table. So it's part two, and um, I just want to set the stage again, like I did last week, as Guy said. First, we know that this is a sensitive topic, and there are re many reasons why. Some relate to maybe some past hurt that some may have experienced in this area of finances before. There's some very bad theology that gets preached and can hurt. We get it. We're not judging you. But I know that I'm the one speaking to you because I get no benefit from what I say to you today. I don't earn a cent from CU. And also know that we're not speaking on the subject because, as Guy said, we're not sitting in financial distress and we're trying to find a way to squeeze the last few drops out of you so that we can go on holiday. We're not desperate. This is a topic we want to touch on every year, as guys mentioned, because, folks, this is important. It's foundational. What Money is everywhere. Money enfolds so much of our life, as I was sharing last week. And I do believe the truth in this area can set us free from a lot of worry and stress on this subject. So if you've been hurt in this area in the past, Please don't close yourself off to this message today. Hear my motive. I want to bring you freedom. I'm trying to bring a biblical perspective onto the subject. And so last week, if you missed it, there were three, three main points that I worked on. The first was, what does the Bible say about uh, money? And it was, firstly, don't love money. The second one is the Bible says, learn contentment. And the third one is the Bible says, God is my provider. And I want to go on from there today, and I want to deal with a few other aspects about what the Bible says about money. If you missed last week, please go and take a listen. It is available on YouTube. I do believe it can be helpful. But also, if you don't fully carry the heart, when I get to the hands, the practical of my message today, it might sound a little empty without understanding fully what I was speaking about last week. We did a bit of a survey. It was anonymous and not designed to catch you out, but I do want to share a few results. We've got 145 responses, so nice sample to work with. So the first question was about, do you give money away regularly, and who do you give it to? And it tells me in general, we're a giving people, folks. I was not too concerned about where we were giving, but this was an encouragement to me. The second one was, do you believe in tithing? And you'll see that most said yes. The next slide. Most said yes. The next question was, do you tithe 10%? And that was closer to a 50-50 split. I just want to say to you on these graphs, my response to this is actually wow. Wow. Because I pulled a survey from a, a U.S. Um, website, and they found that 5% of Christians were giving 10% or more. 
How much do we give? Fairly good spread. Most are giving something, which is great. 40%, more than 10%. Now, the the same survey that I looked at said in the U.S., 77% of givers are giving more than 10%. But in the context of only 5% are tithing, I think this is amazing. 77% of 5% is a lot less than 40% of all of you. So I just want to preface those stats with, with an encouragement to you. What prevents you from tithing? Now, I've excluded the ones that said they do tithe. You'll see there are a few, the, all of those had hits. I can't afford it being the biggest one. Debt levels, I'm going to touch on debt briefly. And you'll see that there were responses in all of those categories as well. But I want to say the main point of the survey was not <laughs> to try and, 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 and find the right results or to give you pressure, but it was to bring you this word. Whatever you answered, you're not alone. Don't think you're the only one doing what you're doing or sitting in the circumstance that you're sitting It's not about singling you out. It's not about trying to make you feel bad. Nor do I want you to walk out today feeling like I'm forcing you to do something. In fact, I want to make something very clear. The offering baskets have already gone around. (laughs) They will not come around again. There is a dustbin outside if you'd like to deposit. (laughs) But that's up to you. (laughs) So, folks, again, please hear my heart in this. I was greatly encouraged by that server. And it's not because how many gave the right answer, is it how many gave the real answer? It's touching. Because I was not after the right answer. So what does the Bible say about money? Point number four. Give. Matthew 6, verse 1 to 4, and forgive me if I don't give you a lot of time to browse to the passages. My time is going to be short today. Matthew 6, 1 to 4 says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. God loves to give. And you might be saying, hang on, but we're talking about our giving. And you're saying, God loves to give. Yes. God loves to give. Why should we not love money? Because God says, love the giver, not the gift. God says, I am the one who made it possible. I am the one who gave it. Love me, not the money. Why should I be content? Because God says, this is what I've given you. Do you believe it's not good enough for you? Why should I trust that God is my provider? Because he has given every good gift to you. James 1, verse 16 to 17. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Matthew 7, 9 to 11. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you, then, who, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good, good gifts to those who ask him? And if God is our example and he loves to give, then surely God wants us to give. I see in God wanting us to give, there's some very key reasons that God wants this in our lives. There's a reason God wants us to be giving. And the first is that giving helps us to learn contentment. It will teach us to remain mindful that God is my provider, and ultimately it's going to break my love of money. 
Giving brings me down a level in a very practical way. What I could afford before, I cannot afford anymore. And so I learned to make a judgment call. Is that thing really so important, or can I actually live without it? And often, <laughs> the answer is yes. I often get quite a lot, I, get, I go along quite well without it. Because let's face it, folks, there's nothing I can get here on earth that is going to compare even a little to what I'm going to get in heaven one day. Like I said last week, it's not bad to hope for and to pray for things. But what we need to learn is how we react when we don't get it. This was, it's going to involve sacrifice. It's going to involve deferring, which ultimately is actually going to teach us to be better stewards of our money. On their website, Bob and Linda Lotich say, there's this famous principle called Parkinson's Law that essentially says that expenses rise to meet income. So if you're having a hard time paying your bills or making a dent in your mountain of debt, more money is likely not your answer. I know this might sound like bad news, but really this is great news. That is because money problems, difficulty paying bills, paying off debt, getting into debt, difficulty saving, or well, most often caused by behavioral problems. How do we change behavior? Well, I'm telling you what, learning to give will definitely do that. Not all debt is bad. Some are in debt not because of what I'm saying above. So I'm not slamming debt. I owe money on my house. Please don't get the wrong picture here. But my decision to buy my house was made, taken into account what I wanted to give. I could have bought a bigger house if I wasn't giving. But I chose not to because I wanted to give. I didn't want the bigger house and to be left in a trap of not being able to give. So I am content with what I have because my motive was to give. Proverbs 21 verse 26 says, some people are always greedy for more, but the godly love to give. Giving breaks greed, and we can stop loving money. We can learn to stop loving money. Giving breaks faith, faithlessness, and we can start trusting in God as our provider. Giving breaks discontent, and we can start enjoying the blessings that God has already given us. There are more reasons to give. And you'll notice those, that first reason is what I spoke about last week. And so these things are intertwined for me. Why does God want us to give? It's to learn these things, learn these principles that he's teaching us. us. But also... God wants us to give because it pleases Him and it is part of our worship. Hebrews 13, verse 15 to 16. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly confess, professes His name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. 510 Rand. I can choose to go and spend it on a chocolate and bring myself joy, although nowadays that's a pretty small chocolate. Or I can give that 10 rand to somebody else and I can please God. <laughs> Bit of perspective. That's ouch, even for me. Like, seriously. And, and folks, this is where people with a gift of mercy get stuck because they feel this urgency to have mercy, but often don't know how to balance it and may get hurt in the process. So I'm not saying don't buy chocolate. I prefer biltong, but chocolate is easier to get for 10 rand. But sometimes, sometimes, why not say, you know what? I'm not buying that chocolate. I'm giving this money away and please God in the process. Why else does God want us to give? Well, because I've actually already received. 
because ultimately everything I have is His, right? If we truly believe that God is our provider, that He has given us everything that we have, how can we not give? King David's dream was to build a temple for God. But God, gave him the task, but, but God gave the task to his son Solomon. David was able to plan and gather the resources for the building. And I want to read a few excerpts from 1 Chronicles 29. Do yourself a favor and go and read 1 Chronicles 29. Then I tear up, literally, when I read this passage. Then King David said to the whole assembly, My son Solomon... The one whom God has chosen is young and inexperienced. The task is great because this palatial structure is not for man, but for the Lord God. With all my resources, I have provided for the temple of my God. And he lists various things that he says he's adding. And he even says, I'm adding my personal treasures, not just the treasures of the kingdom, into this task of building the temple. Then he goes on, now... Who is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today? And then the leaders of families and officers of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands and the commanders of hundreds and the officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly. And again, he lists what was given. The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. 1 Chronicles 29 verse 14. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you and we have only given you what comes from your hand. Folks, this is the heart of giving. Grateful, overflowing, worshiping, adoring God who pours out upon us in the first place. I have other things I want to address along the lines of why God wants us to give. But I have to address the elephant in the room before I continue, and that is the matter of tithing. And with it, I want to address a few practical things as well, but I don't want us to lose focus on what I've just said about the heart of giving. The word tithing in Hebrew and Greek, it's uh, maser and apo, apodekatu. It almost sounds like I got a tattoo. <laughs> it's not what it means. But both of these words literally mean a tenth. And this word is referenced in both Old and New Testament. Leviticus 27 verse 30 a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. This was God's instruction under the Mosaic law, which is the law of Moses, which we read about in the first five books of the Bible. But tithing preceded the law of Moses. In Genesis 14, verse 20b, we'll read, Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. And this tithe that, De- that Abraham was given, giving was to Melchizedek, who was referred to as a king priest. And in the book of Hebrews, we see Jesus being called the priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And that's who Abraham was giving to. Even before that, Cain and Abel in Genesis 4, while it doesn't refer to tithe, They brought offerings to the altar. Abel brought his firstborn. Cain brought just some average produce. And Cain's jealousy over the offering resulted in the first recorded murder. God warned Cain before this. God warned Cain and said, we read in verse 7 of Genesis 4, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. God was addressing his lackluster worship when he brought the offering. It wasn't his best. It wasn't his first fruits. It was just any old thing. Let's toss it in the pile and give God a burnt offering. 
Much later, we read in the Old Testament again, Malachi 3, verse 10, just the first uh, um, sentence there, bring the whole tithe to the storehouse that there may be food in my house. So a tithe was a tenth that was brought to the priests or to the Levites or to, to, the, to the storehouse where God had appointed, and that was often the temple. That was the, intended to be the temple. Verse 8 and 9, God says not tithing was like stealing from him, robbing him. Matthew 23, verse 23. Woe to you, says Jesus, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, dill, mint, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Well, he speaks about the tenth. That means tithe, right? Jesus is criticizing the Pharisees not because they tithe, but because they religiously tithe while forgetting the rest of the law. And I'm pretty sure you're happy to accept that justice, mercy, and faithfulness are valid for us today. So why should we think anything else about what Jesus is speaking here when he mentions the tithe? You'll also read in Scripture, and, and we had the one example from Cain and Abel about an offering. Because of time, I can't go into too much detail but there are many references of, the, of this. And what an offering was, was often, it was, there were many names. There was this thanksgiving offering, a free will offering. And it was intended to express devotion to God. It was brought over and above the tithe to honor God. We read in Malachi 3.10, as I mentioned already, it's speaking literally about bringing the tithe to the storehouse of the temple. And the reality is that the priests and the Levites, who were not landowners, when, when God divided up the promised land, the Levites did not get land, but he said, the tithe is your inheritance. And so it was part of God's plan for the Levites and the priests to literally eat the tithe and that the tithe would support them and support the maintenance of the temple. Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians, and we can read in 1 Corinthians 9, 13 and 14. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple, and that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded those who preach, that, that, that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. In this chapter, Paul is teaching on his right to be supported for bringing the gospel. But he makes the point in this chapter that he has chosen, not been forced to, he's chosen not to use that right. And the reality is, in Church Unlimited, we have more marketplace elders than we have salaried elders. In other words, we earn nothing from the church. We have our own jobs, our own businesses, and I'm one of those. I don't get supported by the church. But to function, we have to have some salaried elders. There's just too much to do. If you're a member of Church Unlimited White River, where is your storehouse? It's here. You don't go and eat at Spur, but go and pay Wimpy, right? Ian suggested that. So if, if, it, if, if the joke failed, I could blame Ian. <laughs> what do we do with the money that we receive? We pay salaries. We look after the premises. We use it to send people on outreach trips. It's, and so much more. But ultimately... We use that money to make sure you've got a place you can come to and you can receive spiritual food and good coffee. So by using the term tithes and offerings, we're not trying to tie ourselves down to Old Testament legalism, but we rather see it as, as a, practic a principle that existed before the law, which Jesus and Paul addressed to support it continuing. Jesus established the church 
If Abraham gave to the priest king, then why should we not give to the work of our priest king, forever Jesus? It is generally helpful to look at it like this. What I'm bringing to the storehouse so that the church can exist and function is my tithe. What I bring to God in thanksgiving over and above is my offering. And so I would encourage you that if you've moved between churches, even different sites of CU, be good stewards of what you're giving and make sure you're paying into the right bank account. We're not in competition with each other as different sites. Please understand that. We often help each other out. That's not the point. But the principle is where you're investing your money and time, you're going to respect and honor more than where you're not. If you move from Sea White River elsewhere, don't feel obliged to keep giving here. Your storehouse has moved. That's fine. Move your tithe to your storehouse. We're not trying to grab and hold on. We're trying to let your spiritual right, uh, you let your giving life reflect your spiritual life. Offerings don't have to be to the church. That's between you and God. So I asked the question in the survey about where you give, not to trick you and say, ha oh, you guys are giving where you shouldn't. No, it's to encourage you, give. Jesus didn't teach against that. And I refer you back again to Matthew 6, where he says, go and give to the needy. Randy Acorn, in a piece titled, Giving Less Than a Tithe, writes, maybe you believe the tithe was an Old Testament standard and we're no longer under, under the law, but under grace. So tithing isn't a requirement for us. Okay, let's say you're right. Now, do you really think God doesn't have a will for New Testament Christians when it comes to giving, or that he has lowered the bar of what he expects of us? Since studies show that the average Christian gives just over 2% of his income to the Lord, does that mean that grace is only a fifth as effective as the law? Or is, it something, or is something fundamentally wrong with our approach to giving? Are we failing to learn what real grace giving means because we children of grace are failing to start at the minimum level God has, start, has started his children on under the old covenant? I view the tithe of 10% as, as I view a child's first steps. His first steps are not his last. Neither are they his best but they are a fine beginning. So is the tithe. Tithing is for many the first toddler's steps of stewardship. It is the training wheels on the bicycle of true giving. It may not be a home run, but it gets you on the base, which is a lot further than the majority of church members ever get. Last week, we heard the testimony of Isabel Ferreira, who applied for a nursing course at MediClinic. In spite of the fact that all the bursaries were already awarded, God broke through and provided for her. What you did not hear was some of the backstory, and with permission, I share this. Chris and Erica had uh, asked me to come and be an accountability partner with them over their finances after attending the finance course. I then challenged them on their budget because it did not include a tithe. I did not tell them you must. I said, think and pray about it. In spite of everything and with this cost and, and of this course potentially hanging over them, they decided they would tithe. And it was after that that God broke through for them and provided the means for their daughter. I know this thing of tithing personally, and that's why I had faith to challenge somebody on it. I started in my early working years, years with the argument, but I earn so little, Lord. When I earn more, I'll give you more. Then I said, you know what, I'm earning more, but you know what, I give so much time to the church. Let me cost that in and deduct it from my tithe. Volunteer your time. Volunteer your time. Commit to the church. It's a good and honorable thing to do, but how good are your motives for serving if I do it so that it can cost me less money? Then I said, well, I'm giving 10%, but about half is for the church and the other half is for missionaries and other welfare organizations. So I'm sorted. 
I'm giving 10%. You see, folks, love of money gave me a lot of wise answers. And that's what it is, folks. If you want to fight me on this 10%, the minimum, I have to ask you to reflect on your motives. You see, one day I was convicted and I knew that I knew that I knew that I had to change things right away. The money I was giving outside of the church was committed. I couldn't suddenly stop giving that money. It would have hurt people. I could not back down on it. And I remember going home and speaking to Nicole, and we're like, you know, we can't actually afford this, but this is our conviction. We feel God telling us this is what we must do. So we did. We immediately started giving our 10% to the church. And, folks, my testimony is that since then, I have worried so much less about money. Unexpected bonuses. SARS refunds. I'm an accountant, and they surprised me sometimes. Sometimes I just couldn't understand the math of why there was still money in the bank. And that's why, folks, I have a conviction and a confidence in challenging in this area because I have walked it out. It doesn't mean that everything was rosy in my finances. It's actually been quite a tough year, and I blame the fact that I gave this money talk last year. God said, well, I'm going to test you some more then, if you're so confident. But the fact that I'm tithing means that I've learned to trust God in spite of what I might be going through right now. So if you're struggling financially, my first question to you is going to be, are you tithing and are you giving 10% to the church? That does not mean that everybody who struggles does not tithe. Hear that. God is going to take you on a different journey. Even now, as I said, it's been a tough year but I've continued to tithe. I sometimes look at that and think, why? But then I remember, but you know what? God's given this money to me already. I cannot back down on my commitment to Him. Tough times are still tough. But if you're faithfully giving, it's going to be easier and easier to rely on Him. If you are struggling financially. We do run a finance course from time to time. Get the details. Get plugged into that. Now, hopefully there's one real soon in Bombella. I don't know when we next schedule one here. But we need to learn how to steward our money. Learn how to deal with money. There are critical skills that can help you and me <laughs> that are just, I can't get to those now. You, you're going to need to put some effort in and, and, and join one of these courses or We'll get some more material. But I want to say this to close on, on, on this topic of tithing. If you don't believe in tithing, I hope that today you can believe in giving. And I hope that you can see the need to give to your storehouse. If you can't afford to tithe, I want, you to I want to challenge you to draw up a budget and make the hard choices you need to sooner rather than later. It's just a good idea, even if I wasn't talking about tithing and giving this morning. Don't spend what you cannot afford, folks. That is love of money. If you don't understand how to tithe, my encouragement is start at 10%. It's such a helpful number because it forces us to give something up when we go to 10%. If you are in business, tithe on your drawings. I'm not asking you to tithe on your company's turnover. But tithe what you draw from your company and consider whether it's not time for you to start using your business as a vehicle for generosity and for offering.
over and above what you're tithing. If you forget, we have an app for that. But folks, the reality is my first debit order every month is my tithe. It usually goes off a day or two after, I get, after my salaries are paid. Um, you could argue that this is binding me to religion. I say to you, it keeps me from temptation. And it helps me to remember. Because, like we were talking about that uh, law earlier, expenses meet income very, very quickly. If it's not there... I just can't spend it. Let's put that down for a moment. And I want to touch on two more reasons why God wants us to give. God wants us to give because it can give us joy. I have the privilege of sowing financially into this church, into Sinani into other organizations. And once you get over the fear and the doubt, it becomes pure joy. The amount is not important, folks. The heart is. If your 10% is 10 cents, bring it. Jesus rejoices in Mark 12 when the poor woman puts two coins in the offering plate. There are two lies the enemy tries to tell us. If we don't earn a lot and our tithe is small, he says it's not good enough, don't bother. That's a lie. Give, even if it's small. The other lie he tells you is, oh, you, your 10% is so much, you don't have to give it all. It's a lie from the enemy. The amount is not what's important to God. The heart is. Lastly, folks, and, and if you've missed me and my heart of giving, you might struggle to hear this one. So I want to be very clear with it. This is not why I give, but why God wants us to give. Because He wants to bless us even more. I skipped a few sentences when I read Malachi 3 verse 10. I want to read that whole verse to you now. Bring the whole tithe to the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. I want to make it very clear. I'm not saying give so that you can receive. This is not a prosperity gospel. I'm saying we're giving out of, the overflow of, out of an overflow of gratitude for what God has already given us. 1 Chronicles 29, 14, I want to read that again. But who am I and who are my people that I should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. The moment we give with a heart that says, I want to receive, we're right back into love of money. Don't go there. Louis Null, one of the elders from CU Bombella, shares the story of desiring a motorbike. So he tires his bicycle and God gave him a pair of shoes. <laughs> is your offering, is your tithe, is your giving a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God? Or is your giving grudging, unhappy, with wrong motivations? If the latter is how giving is going to make you feel, if you're going to feel like giving is a grudge, brings you unhappiness, and your motives are wrong, <laughs> don't give. Go first and understand this heart of giving. Go and understand why do I feel like that when I give, so that when you give, you can do so with joy, and so that it can be a pleasing and fragrant offering. If you feel compelled to give because Leon said so, don't give. Go and understand Scripture and get God's heart, why He wants you to give. Then give with joy so that it can be a pleasant and fragrant offering. Not giving does not mean you're not going to heaven. But like baptism, like reading the Bible, like praying, like worshiping, this is an obedience issue, not a salvation issue. 
saying no to any of these does not saying no to any of these means you will miss out on the fullness of what God wants to give you for your obedience. But I'm not trying to bring down fires of hell and brimstone on you for not giving. I said at the start that as a church we're in a financially sound position. We still are. But I want to tell you, because of the growth we've seen in the last few years, we've had to make a few financial decisions in the last few months, which required us as elders to dig deep into our own reserves of faith. It started with Peter appointing for the first time somebody with a stipend to look after the youth. We're appointing Francel to come in and start helping in the office because Joe just cannot cope. Talita's coming on to help with operations. In a few months, we're moving kidsmen to the house because we just cannot cope in our facilities anymore. If we had the resources as a church, I personally would love to put more salaried elders into CU White River. If the church in general, not just us, please hear me here, if the church in general was giving faithfully, I believe that you should be able to appoint an eldership couple for every 20 families in a church. It's a rough calculation, and I know it's not always going to be 100% accurate. But, folks, hear my heart. My desire is that we can appoint more elders, bring them on full-time. Because, yes, the, the Rebros, the Van der Waals, the Stones, and the Combrinks, we're trying our best to help where we can. But, folks, there's too much work in a growing church. There's so much more to do. If you haven't heard it before, a couple of weeks ago, we had an architect with us for the weekend. We're starting to put plans and paper for a new building. Why are we doing this? We see God is adding to our number, and we believe that God wants to prepare us for more and more and more. And so in faith, we want to act on His instruction. So unashamedly, yes, folks, we're going to be asking you for money. But it's not to enrich ourselves. It's because we see what God is doing, and we believe this is where He's taking us. And so, folks, I don't even know, want to know what the building is going to cost. But I have faith that God is going to raise that. I have faith that He's going to raise it from amongst you. Because I believe God wants to give generously to all of us. And so I want to encourage you, folks. Get the heart right on giving. But once again, if you're struggling with what I'm saying now, I want, to, I want to encourage you to go back to point number one. Are you struggling with the love of money? Are you struggling with reliance on what the world calls wealth and, 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 and success? Because then, folks, all of this is going to be difficult for you to be hearing this morning. And so again, folks, I don't, want to, I don't want you to walk out here saying, Leon said I must. Folks, I'm saying, think about it. Pray about it. We're going to be sharing these scriptures on the WhatsApp group. If, you, if, you can't, if you're not on the WhatsApp group or want a copy of them, please get in touch with us. We'll get it to you. Go and reflect on these scriptures and ask God to open your heart to giving. But I want to give you the opportunity this morning, folks. We, guys, going to share a testimony, and we, we want to then close with a, a song. God is a God of miracles. And if you're caught right now financially, if you're stuck in a trap, I want to tell you this is the message you need to be hearing. It's not a money issue, folks. It's a behavior issue. Yes, I know there are exceptions, as I said. And we, we, we want to pray with you, if, even if you're one of those exceptions. But, folks, God loves a giving heart. And so we want to present Him with a giving heart. Amen.
Wow. Amazing. Thank you, Leon. Thanks for your humility and your tenderness around that subject. <laughs> when I was about 14, um, my family and myself went to a, a dam in the area that we were staying in. Spent the day on the dam. And my folks stayed on and I decided to go back home with the family. Uh, or it was the husband. And not realizing that he had had a couple too many tots. He, uh, he wasn't, he, he was a little bit tipsy, let's put it like that. And I didn't realize that, my family didn't realize that. So I sat in the back of the bucky with him driving, a couple of my mates. And he drove home like a maniac. And there was fear in the bucky. But I remember so clearly the Lord saying to me, it's going to be all right. I mean, that's like, I don't know, four, nearly 40 years ago. And I've, I, it's come up again during this chat on finance, and I've, I've been trying to figure out why. Because it's got nothing to do with money. It's got everything to do with faith. And I was reminded of that again. It's going to be all right. I think everything that Leon's been talking about now has to do with faith. It has to do with this trust in God. It's my honor. It's my privilege to be able to say at any time it's going to be all right because he's, he's going to look out for us even financially. I, I have this dream for my life and my family's life that we would be open-handed with finance. And, and I have this dream for this church as well that we would be people that are not tight-fisted not stingy, but that if there was a reputation that this church had in this community, it would be when those guys come to the restaurant, they tip well. When those guys um, owe money, they, owe, they pay it on time. That even every now and then we'd be in a queue and we'd see someone in front of us. And it's not because they're necessarily poor, but there's just this, this overflow of gratitude like I had in the back of the bucky, God saying, it's going to be okay, relax, you'll be fine, I'm with you. The sense of trust and faith, that it overflows, that it's not just for me, it's not just for my family, but that I'd actually want to say to the lady or the guy in front of me, I'd love to cover your bill, please. And a few times we've done that, it's the funniest thing. If the reactions in the queue are just like, you paying for my bill, why are you doing that? But you go to a restaurant, and you just look behind your shoulder, and you see a family or a couple that are enjoying the day, and you say to the waiter, I'll get their bill. I think that's something of what we're talking about here. Is it, it's where this thing of giving so consumes us that actually it becomes an act of worship as opposed to an act of, I have to, you know. It's almost from wallet to worship, where my focus is no longer on the wallet and on the money, but it's everything that I do comes out of this place of worship that we get this reputation, we have this reputation in our homes and in this community that those guys, those Christians, they're just secure and they're generous. And there's an overflow that comes out of them. That's the dream I have. And as we've been working this thing through and preparing for all sorts of things, for me, more than money, more than anything else that stood out is, Lord, You've been so good to me. The least I can do is give back to you. I have a dream that as a church, we're not skeptical anymore about this topic of finances. You can see how lightly Leon tread, tread, treaded, <laughs> trod. <laughs> and he did so well. But wouldn't it be awesome to get to a place where as a church, every, when we talk about money, actually there's just a sense of, because at the moment, I mean, we know because we hear stories. People, when they hear about this topic, often it just it, it gets really messy. And there's skepticism around it. I have a dream where that's not the case anymore. Where the money thing's not the issue. The issue is gratitude. From wallet to worship. Lord, you've been so good to me. The least I can do in my business is find an opportunity, an outlet to give. I want to be a giving person. As a family where every now and then we sit down and we say, who can we bless? Like God's been so good to us. Who can we bless? And why don't we bless Him some more? And it's, just, it's, it's not stingy living. It's God, you're so good. The least I can do is I want to give back. 
That's my dream. That's our dream as a family. And it's, it's our dream as an eldership for this church. Amen. Let's stand together. I kind of feel like as we sing the song, I know time's up. But just whisper some prayers to the Lord. Of, you know, at a, a meeting like this, all sorts of things are happening. And whatever you need to just have a little chat to him about, just say, Lord, if I've been holding too tight, if I have fallen to that trap of love of money, if I'm anxious every single day about money, if I'm living in anxiety because I'm scared I'm not going to have enough, if I'm always consumed about retirement and the fear that we're not going to make it and that the family's going to be stranded, if you're living like that, it's not God's will. Just lay it down. Just lay it down. Just surrender and ask him to take you on this journey this exciting journey because he's so generous. Let's do that. Lord, we commit ourselves to you now. May we be a generous people. May we love to give. Lord, may we be like Jesus was and like you are, Christ, Christ Jesus our Lord, where you gave yourself to us. May we be a giving people. May it be our privilege and our absolute delight to give, not just, not just a little here and there, but sometimes even when it hurts, Lord, we make a decision as a family or as individuals to give away something we can't afford, not because we have to, but because we just love giving. Lord, would you make us like that? Would you make me more like that where I'm still stingy? I want to open my heart more there, Lord. And I pray that we as a church would live like that in Jesus' name. Let's sing a song.